and uh, Cyber Dandy here is going to to introduce the discussion uh, as I force that upon him before you arrive. So, here. yeah, surprise, surprise. So, uh, yeah, welcome uh, everybody. Ben Burgess from Give Them an Argument and many other things. Douglas Lane from Sublation Media and also other things, and myself, Cyber Dandy from Cyber Dandy. Um, recently, Ben hosted a class on Proudhon versus Marx, and we read the first half of Proudhon's System of Economic Contradictions, which is the only half available in English, and then followed it up with a reading of Marx's Poverty of Philosophy, which is a critique of that book, more or less. Um, so I think how many months were we in that class, Ben? Like four or five? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe like four. It, it was like, they're both, you know, they're both short books, but you know, we went over it relatively slowly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we wanted to follow up on that and do an episode together because Doug had, uh, uh, worked with me on the idea of eventually doing something on Proudhon and you had this class coming up. So we thought it'd be great if all of us got together and uh, chatted it out. Nice. You guys have me at a disadvantage. I have read the poverty philosophy and skimmed the Proudhon, but I um, did not spend months studying it. So uh, I expect to be corrected as we go through the conversation. Well, if you had one thing that you know is that the corrected is going to be hard because um, Proudhon's writing style means that it's uh, often a little tricky to to nail down exactly. I mean, it, it depends. Some some parts of it are clearer than others, but it's often fairly tricky to nail down what he, what he means. I mean, it's like so. I, I think part of the reason uh, that so many more people have read the poverty philosophy is is just that it's like so much better written that like you know that it's. Uh, you know, that he's kind of at an advantage there that has nothing to do with the ideas that they're arguing about. Well, I um, I took a glance at both texts and I thought that, the, you know, obviously biased in favor of Marx. I thought the major difference was that Proudhon spoke in abstract generalities in general. And uh, whereas Marx, well, Marx, wasn't writing capital or something like that when he was responding to Proudhon. So he was often sniping mm -hmm. uh, at Proudhon. But um, but I, I generally found myself, you know, predisposed to siding with Marx and then easily confirmed in my initial assumptions. Um, but what I can I, I have written down here and both of you can tell me how far from the mark I am mm. or if I'm close. Mm. Um, the primary criticism of Proudhon um, is that he assumes what he sets out to explain. He needs to, uh, what needs to be added is a description of how exchange. So this is in the um, section on opposition value, the opposition of value and use and value in exchange. This okay. Is, uh, and it's worth noting that Marx doesn't begin his critique of Proudhon with chapter one, but with chapter two of the Proudhon, because the first chapter is, kind of twaddle so um the, the the primary criticism is that Proudhon assumes what he sets out to explain um that is uh he needs to uh, add a description of how exchange value came to dominate society mm -hmm. and said Proudhon takes exchange value as a natural consequence of mankind's desires and suggests that exchange value ar arose through some sort of agreement amongst men um, right Proudhon supposes that no bourgeois economists have noticed the opposition between exchange value and use value. Marx corrects him on this um, and demonstrates that the opposition is well known amongst bourgeois economists. Oh, it's a well known fact. Um, but the, that would be my the overall critique of Proudhon, if you put it in a more mm. generalized way, would be that Proudhon takes uh, the current conditions of society, of bourgeois society, as um natural uh and uh doesn't arrive at their how they developed um historically nor does he provide a systematic understanding of the categories of bourgeois society um but instead speaks of things in kind of abstract 
general ways and creating his own dichotomies along the way would sometimes or often enough obscure more than they reveal that would yeah be... that's de that's definitely not bad for not reading uh reading it super close that criticism is in there for sure um i i don't really accept the criticism mm -hmm. entirely because the way that prudhomme pitches his book is as a direct response to the political economists and utopian socialists at the time so he's beginning from their importance that they place on value and exchange value and not like marx developing this history of how we got to where we are so i, I guess i'm not i'm not sure about this part um because this is like whether you're right about that or not isn't really directly answered within the text uh that there there isn't um you know i mean i i think that it's possible that that's right uh they uh but you know he certainly doesn't say as much um and i i don't know i mean like you're talking to, to to cyber dandy now that that Proudhon doesn't say that he's directing this yeah as a it, it's, 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 well, I mean, he certainly does criticize both of those groups of people in the book. That's true, right? Like he does, mm. you know, he he is critical of both bourgeois economists and utopian socialists in the book. But, um, but I, I, you know, this sort of assumption that it's like, well, um, that's, you know, therefore this sort of explains how he's presenting things that, you know, he's sort of accepting their assumptions or something like that. Uh, that's, no, no, no. Oh, okay. He definitely, he definitely says it right from the outset that uh the political economists take value to be the cornerstone of their their theory and mm -hmm. this is how i'm going to respond to them and i have a bunch of quotes about this but it's sure i'd i'd, I'd actually be i mean i don't know how much time we'll spend on this but i'd actually be pretty interested in seeing the quotes but uh they but um but yeah i, I mean I, I guess like Marx's defense of the honor of the bourgeois economist maybe strikes me as the least interesting part of the uh the poverty of uh philosophy. I think that the um you know but but I think elements of of the rest of what Doug says uh do do line up with you know with I think what are more interesting things that might be going on there and you know and and um you know and and I think that the sort of um you know, most interesting to me difference between Marx and Proudhon is is roughly along the lines of one of the things Doug just said, right, which is about the the approach towards economic history and and hence in Marx's mind the history of all the stuff that's super structural from uh, from from economics. Um, so that um, you know. Proudhon talks a lot about uh, uh, like humanity as a whole, the social genius. You know, he uh, he uses this uh, this name Prometheus for uh, the sort of uh, collective genius of humanity. You know, figuring things out over time, and um, and it it does seem to me that you know that he basically does have this this view that you know it's it's not. It's not static in the sense that there's no historical progress. Of course, Perdon definitely thinks there is historical progress, but um, the sort of ground on which that progress is happening in a certain way, I think, is kind of static for uh, for uh, for Perdon. That uh, that he uh, that he does, in fact, when he's talking about things like uh, exchange, uh, he does, in fact, talk about that as this sort of um, a priori like conceptual problem that prometheus has to solve you know how how do we uh go about um you know getting the benefits of you know lots of different kinds of you know activities that people do without doing them all yourself uh and yeah, yeah. and um and that's and there is a lot of that kind of a thing there right you know that he he sort of you know he's you know Proudhon, I think, sees history in terms of 
uh, in terms of like humanity sort of collectively figuring out how to solve these problems that that it has in the broadest sense, right? So whereas um, what what Marx sees are the you know these um, different modes of production that are that uh, that that kind of have their own laws, their own needs that uh, where and that the you know what's going on within them and how the transitions between them happen is um is all about uh is all about class struggle and uh and it and it is and so like for example um i don't want to i don't want to run away with this too much uh if if you were going somewhere else but do you want me to keep going with this uh no i think i mean so far i basically agree i might put it in different terms but yeah. Okay. And I and I have an addition to make, sure. which is that it's not not only does he see that you're quite right, I think, um, Ben, that he sees that there are different modes of production and therefore different kind of grounds for uh, the social problems that we face. In other words, we face different problems mm -hmm. based on the different ways in which we've organized uh, our material reproduction, say. But um, beyond that, he gives a specific example um, to kind of overturn um, Proudhon's approach, which is that, in fact, the uh -huh. exchange didn't dominate society in the way that it does now. In the past, it was not a universal problem uh, that was just based on man's Promethean nature, but um, something changed. And, and it used to be in the, in the past that people were mostly uh producing th what they needed for themselves right. they were subsistence farmers and wh while there might have been lords who took a tax from all the different peasant farmers nonetheless uh the range of production was uh much narrower and the kinds of uh things that people needed and therefore the need for exchange was much narrower um so one of the ways we can look at um the change in production is also a, a way of kind of expanding the Promethean nature of the human person that in a bourgeois society, we become more obviously Promethean. We become more obviously expansive uh, because the demands of the economy are such that there will be and more needs for innovation and more needs for uh, uh, an expansion of production and creation of new needs. Um, yeah. So that what's transformed is the kind of character of, Humanity, what it may be, the, the, what's developed is the realm of freedom uh, under bourgeois uh, conditions. Certainly the character of freedom has changed um, as the mode of production has changed. It's a social relationship around that, that's necessary for that mode of production to, to be instantiated has changed. So that's all so, I'd add. Yeah, I think where where the biggest difference is that Proudhon tends to tie things to exchange itself and Marx ties things to modes of production. Uh, I think part of the confusion as far as the trans historical way that exchange is depicted in Proudhon's work is that uh, what he wants to say is that there's no such thing as value until you have exchange. And so until people start exchanging things with each other, it's not, those things aren't thought of as value, uh, as exchange value. They're just useful things, right? So he's, he doesn't give an account of this emergence of exchange society because what he's focused on is value and right. what is value. Uh, but he does also say, though, Right. It's it's not just that he's not focused on it. I mean, like he does very explicitly say that uh people start exchanging because they have this like a priori problem, you know, of like how uh they're going to, you know, they're going to meet these various needs. And um and then, you know, and then sure he does say the exchange hasn't always existed. He does, you know, that's that's true, right? But like he also uh he also says, like, as he's describing it coming into existence, like he says like you know, the, like he describes, like he, the word he actually uses is like logical, this logical problem of like how we're going to like meet our needs or whatever. And then he says like, he has some formulation, like the historical process follows the, 
the logical order. So, you know, so, so he does, um, you know, he does see, he does, he really does portray these sort of needs that t- exchange satisfies as, as being sort of timeless and intrinsic to the human condition. The needs, I think, yes. Um, but then he goes on to say that new values are increasingly created as human beings start exchanging with each other. And sort of what Doug just said, that you do get into more complex societies where you are generating new values all the time. Um, what? There, sure. I think the way I'd put it, there's dynamism in Proudhon's system, but Come it's on. more like a screensaver than like a movie. Uh-huh. So, yeah. you know, like, like you'll have something bouncing around on your screen for a screensaver, but you don't really have this kind of development over time that you get in Marx. Uh, yeah, I like, I like the metaphor. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that the, it's, you know, like, like it, it just does seem to me that the way that Perdon describes it, you definitely get this picture that it's the, you have, you have this sort of timeless problem that maybe very slowly gets solved. Right. But that's a that's a very different view from saying that, you know, essentially you have new problems that arise from, you know, from from new stages of history that, you know, that like come uh, that, you know, if um, again. So so what I was started to say earlier, right, is is that I, is that I think, you know, probably one of the places in. Um, uh I mean, when I read this in the, you know, uh, system of economic contradictions or, you know, the, uh, one translation of the subtitle, and sometimes it's used as the title, that's what Marx's title is playing off of, you know, the philosophy of poverty, uh, the, um, one, uh, one passage in there. And when I read it, did not have the poverty philosophy, you know, freshly in mind, but it still really hit me as like, oh, wow, this is like where the difference between Proudhon and Marx gets super obvious. And then Marx indeed uh goes after this passage in the poverty of philosophy is when Proudhon's talking about the French Revolution and he says uh that um uh he says that you know it would be ridiculous to try to uh reverse this historical progress of the French Revolution, you know, that uh, that proclaimed free trade along with all the other freedoms uh that they were that they were fighting for. Um and you know he doesn't use this language. This is my gloss on what he's saying, right? But like he he seems to, you know, his view seems to be well. This is like one of like Prometheus's like settled verdicts, you know, that the that like, you know, humanity figured out that it needed you know free trade, and so now we we just have to build on that, right? As we go into this sort of you know mutualist alternative to to both you know capitalism and the views of the European socialists that he's going to put forward. And Marx's response to that in the poverty of philosophy is exactly what you'd expect it to be, given Marx's views, which is that he says, wait a second, this is absurd. You're saying that, you know, because bourgeois revolutionaries in the 18th century uh, proclaimed free trade to meet their historical needs at the time, that means that other people in the 19th century don't have other historical needs, you know, in the name of, you know, in the name of which they might overthrow it, right? Like that they, and I think you really get that difference between that, um, you know, sort of timeless problem that's slowly being solved and the new problems that arise at new times in history views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. And that, and I want to go back to defend uh, the fact that Marx critiqued Proudhon for misunderstanding the bourgeois economist. Yeah. Yeah. You guys fight about that. (laughs) Because um, the reason he is important to note that the bourgeois economists had reached similar conditions, conclusions to Proudhon that Proudhon claims to have reached on his own, but also uh, to realize that their development of the ideas were more systematic and more thoroughgoing and less uh, idealized than, uh, and, you know, less abstract than um, Proudhon's. And the reason all that's important to realize is because also those guys, like especially Adam Smith, were advocating for a new, a new form of society when they wrote. They were revolutionaries of kind then and um so that it is comparing the bourgeois revolutionaries to the socialist revolutionaries and one of the things that marx is doing 
was critiquing reactionary elements, regressive elements within the socialist movement, the romantic strains within the socialist movements. Um, and so it's worth noting that Proudhon is falling below the level of Adam Smith, as he writes. He's, he's not as advanced as a bourgeois economist. Um, I know I, I sound like a, a, a certain platypus person, but it still, it is there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah it's such, such a more palatable version. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that that's that's probably that's probably right. That and and I'll sorry, I'll, I'll let Cyber Dandy respond, but I, I just wanted to put a pin in the fact that like something that would be really good to touch on here is because uh, Proudhon definitely does have a critique of the utopian socialists, but you know what the difference is between that critique and Marx's critique. But yeah, Cyber Dandy, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I I think one thing I just want to point out before we go much further is that. The poverty of philosophy has way more that it misses than what it hits. We're definitely hitting on the good parts, but the first two chapters at least are really full of misrepresentations and kind of just jousting and not really deep arguments. And it's really the second part of the book that you get some of these better arguments about methodology and Stuff Can you like give that. me an example of um, uh, a clear miss or a misrepresentation from the first yeah. chapter? Because because I kind of took my examples, I think, like I have an example about the use value and exchange value opposition. I think that's from the first chapter. But um, but what do you see as a, as a miss? So one thing that Marx gets on Proudhon for in the in the first bit of this is he says that Proudhon confuses uh, the seller with uh, the buyer or something along those lines where he inverts like, let me put this another way. Proudhon makes it very clear that use value, uh, the buyer, and um, uh, are one side of the exchange, whereas exchange value is determined by an estimate of what the buyer's going to pay for it there's a point that marx keeps hitting on throughout the first chapter where he keeps saying that no Proudhon inverse inverted this or Proudhon forgot about demand right and there's whole this whole ongoing thing about Proudhon not understanding how demand works and it's i've gone through sentence by sentence and compared the text and found you know every way that this is incorrect uh and not really what Proudhon said at all um well i mean so, i found that section in the poverty of philosophy um should we go over it and see what's wrong with it here so he says um these are what we should call um, the, okay these are what we should almost call truisms yet we have to repeat them here in order to render mr Proudhon's mysterious Mystery is comprehensible. So that following, this is Proudhon now, so that following up the principle to its ultimate consequences, one would come to the conclusion, the most logical in the world, that the things whose use is indispensable and whose quantity is unlimited should be had for nothing. And those whose utility is nil and whose scarcity is extreme should be of incalculable worth. To cap the difficulty, these extremes are impossible in practice. On the one hand, no human product could ever be unlimited in magnitude. On the other, even the scarcest thing would preforce be useful to a certain degree. Otherwise, they would be quite valueless. Use value and exchange value are thus inexorably bound up with each other, although by their nature, they continually tend to be mutually exclusive. And then Marx says, what caps uh, Proudhon's difficulty? That he has simply forgotten about demand and that yeah. a thing can be scarce or abundant only insofar as it is in demand. The moment he leaves out demand, he identifies exchange value with scarcity and use value with abundance. In reality, in saying that things whose utility is nil and scarcity extreme are incalculable, are of incalculable worth, he is simply declaring that exchange value is merely scarcity. Scarcity extreme and utility nil means pure scarcity. Incalculable worth is the maximum of exchange value. It is pure exchange value. He equates these two terms. Therefore, exchange value and scarcity are equivalent terms. 
in arriving at right. these alleged extreme consequences, Proudhon has in fact carried out to the carried to the extreme not the things but the terms which express them, and in so doing, he shows proficiency proficiency in rhetoric, in all their nakedness. No, wait, rather than logic, he merely rediscovers his first hypothesis in all their nakedness when he thinks he discovered new consequences. Now I'll stop there. Right, and that's actually one of the main portions I'm referring to. Right. So. Like Prudhomme equates demand and use value and the buyer. These are, uh, that's the way he thinks about it, right? So there's no point at which he forgets about demand. He just doesn't explicitly say demand. Um, he's saying that we could only value things if they are useful and that are somewhere between totally scarce and totally abundant. So value can only really happen between those two extremes. That's what he's getting at in this thing that Marx is responding to. Uh, so what is now what is Marx what is Marx claiming here that he he's saying um that he leaves out demand in terms of determining whether something is scarce or not. Right? Yeah, so he right. So I and think demand Marx is, is being equated with use value. Which is on the side of production? Is is that how it's split with, within Proudhon? I think the point Marx is trying to make is that because Proudhon doesn't factor in demand in the market, that he thinks that markets operate just by abundance and scarcity. Oh, okay. I'm, well, not, I'm not sure it's true I'm that not it's sure in the Marx, market. Marx is saying that, actually, right? Like, that, that Proudhon is, is saying that, right? I, I think... Um, I was gonna. I was largely planning to stay out of this part because I wasn't sure I had a I had a strong view about whether you know Marx was getting put on right in this part. But um, it seems like it seems like what Marx is saying, as I recall that passage, is that um, is that Proudhon is treating this something as a big mystery. That's only a big mystery if you describe it or set up the problem in a way that doesn't account for for demand right i mean that was my impression of what the what the the accusation was i I think that's a different accusation than like proudhon in general like doesn't know that demand exists or something like that Mm -hmm. well let's just be let's be clear what is proudhon saying in the in this paragraph he's saying um the, the what so he's saying the following up the principle to its ultimate consequences one would come to conclusion that the things whose use is indispensable and whose quantity is unlimited should be had for nothing. So in other words, we're talking about what sets a price here. And if and if the quantity of something is uh, uh, unlimited and it's very useful, then demand would not um, determine that it would be have a high price because there's an unlimited supply. And so therefore it would be had for nothing. Um, and then on the other hand, if you have something that is not useful, but is very, that, that's very scarce, um, then it would be of whose utility is nil and whose scarcity is extreme. It should be of, you know, an infinite price, which is an absurd conclusion. Um, to cap the difficulty, these extremes are impossible in practice on the, so he's saying, so, uh, we don't. This we don't encounter this. This isn't what happens, but according to the logic of economics, it should. I think no human product could ever be unlimited in magnitude, and even the scarcest thing must must have some use value, or else it wouldn't have any value. So use value and exchange value are thus inextricably bound up with each other, although by their nature they continually tend to be mutually ex- mutually exclusive. So, all right, so. What is he saying here that is uh that Marx is objecting to? Is he just saying not very much? Is that the objection do you think, Ben? That he's like uh explaining something that need not be explained? Uh yeah, I mean this is part of what I was why I was gonna sit out this part of the discussion because because I don't I'm not sure I have a confident view about what uh what Pradhan is um is saying there, uh but you know, again, my my memory of the at least the structure 
of Marx's objection is that, you know, Proudhon is setting up these, uh, these antinomies that, you know, that, that he sees as these sort of like, you know, kind of profound, mysterious things, uh, that, um, and that, that Marx is saying, no, it's, it's not actually that, you know, mysterious or you're, you're making it mysterious by, by describing it in this kind of obtuse way that, that leaves out, you know, this like really big factor. So right. if you look at the bigger context of the quote that Marx gives in the book, this is a section where Proudhon is basically laying out why scarcity and abundance matter. Uh, he does this before moving on to other impacts on value and on exchange value. So it's like Marx is taking uh, a preliminary idea that Proudhon is talking about and expecting to get a more advanced idea out of it which he does a few times um and then uh he'll later quote some other piece of Proudhon and all of a sudden you know demand is there or Proudhon is saying the thing that Marx said he didn't say or vice versa this is the kind of stuff that I don't it doesn't hit very well if you're really going to examine both texts next to each other well, I mean, we can, um, we're kind of doing that right now, um, right? Because I have both both texts open on, on my computer. It's amazing the technology, right? Um, so if but, you, uh, yeah, so if you look this at the is full in the, quote. Is this quote um, of Proudhon's in the first chapter or the second? I mean, in the second is, chapter. Of the, it should um, be the second. Almost everything Marx quotes is going to be from pretty much the same area except a few bits from volume two um which kind of makes me doubt if marx read the whole book but um okay yeah yeah um i bet he did uh because he's marx um and and we love marx okay so what uh, uh, also, <laughs> also like i think that marx can be fairly accused of a lot of different kinds of bad behavior and like faction fights but I don't really think one of them is not doing every possible bit of reading he could get his hands on in every circumstance. Like, uh, this is a, right. this is a guy who, you know, spent like thousands of hours, like reading, like the reports of English factory inspectors. He's writing capital. He has a, uh, that, uh, you know, like he teaches himself Russian in part to, you know, to try to, to try to get, you know, like answer a question. Somebody yeah, asked, I mean, about, you know, like, 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 so in, in other, in other words, like, I, you know, I think like, like when you're saying Marx isn't showing sufficient interpretive charity, that doesn't stretch the bounds of the imagination for me. It's like, yeah, okay. I think that's something Marx might've done, right? That they have a, he might've like gotten pissed off about it and like interpreted something in, in a bad light. Or if you say like, you know, he was like in many ways, guy was kind of a bare knuckle brawler as far as this stuff goes, but like, come on, he did the reading. I mean, no, I seriously have questions about that because I don't understand why he's quoting things on a topic from chapters that aren't dedicated to that topic. Uh, I don't understand why all the quotes are coming from only these first couple chapters or even the first sections of the chapters. And it's not that I think Marx doesn't have the capacity or doesn't have the, the will to want to do that. To me, it feels like he thinks Proudhon is so dumb that all he has to do is find like the epitome of Proudhon in these few sections and critique that, and that'll produce a sufficient work on its own. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think whatever was available to him at the time, I'm, I'm, I just, I just. Well, we can't know for sure. There were no security cameras, as, as you say. There's no way to know. But well, I guess one way we we could know is whether or not, um, what he's critiquing, the critiques actually land. Right. I mean, so the question for me is, what is the claim that that Proudhon is making here that Marx is critiquing? Why is it uh, important to uh, for Proudhon to point out that there's a mystery? Because he does uh, about um, uh, the fact that uh, 
scarcity let's see what does he say that scarcity is on the side of use values and you can find abundance on the side of exchange or something like that that these things are connected you know and not so, so, completely separated out um so right so what Prudhon is doing here is he's saying why when people produce more are they worth less in exchange and it's because they're creating an abundance. Whereas if you want something to be worth more in exchange, there needs to be a scarcity for it. And he's laying out how abundant and how scarce they need to be. It can't be totally abundant and it can't be totally scarce. It needs to be somewhere between those two so that there is a value to exchanging them. So Proudhon is saying that the source of value and therefore in some way or another, a price is either the scarcity or uh, the abundance of the commodities? Only in this section, because he goes on to discuss the way that estimated value on the part of the seller is a way that the, the seller is trying to figure out what the use value is of the buyer for whatever the product is. And this is something else Marx confuses. He, when he talks about it, he doesn't realize that Prudhon is talking about, you know, I want to sell you a chicken. I have to figure out how much you're going to pay for it, is what Prudhon means by estimated value. Marx seems to take that to mean something else. What does he, what does Marx take it to mean? Um, I'd have to look at my notes, but I know I commented on it. Was, I mean, just uh, kind of a, my knee jerk reaction to this is to say that um, while abundance and scarcity um, are operating factors in determining price, but the way they do that is mediated um, through production. So if something is um, abundant, that would probably mean that it didn't take a lot of labor to produce just to be real simple minded about it. And so that it would, it's price, which would be connected to the labor time, although not identical to it would be lower uh, because it could be produced more easily and quickly. And therefore it would be more abundant. Then if the price were to then go up, it would probably be because the, uh, number of workers dedicated to producing that particular item would decline as profitability in that sector declined. And therefore, the if the demand held steady, the uh, supply would decline. But it is not simply the demand or the scarcity that is determining the value. Right. Rather, it is the amount of time dedicated to producing Right. The commodity. And so, and I haven't, so does Proudhon, I mean, that, so, I mean, by, at, at this point, we're like reaching the level of Adam Smith, right? Oh, uh, like Ben Burgess. Oh, I, I think see. he'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Just one word. But, so, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Proudhon definitely gets into all of that later. I mean, throughout the work, he's, he's working his way up you know, from really the bare minimum uh, conceptual framework you need to understand value. And then eventually he'll get into credit. He'll get into international trade. You know, in the second volume, he uh, gets into a lot more complex issues. But that's why I find it so, like... A uh, dumb, dumb question, but since you're the Perdon expert, do you... Uh... Uh, were the were the two volumes published simultaneously? I uh, I believe they were. Okay. I'm. I don't know if I would say I'm an expert. I've. Uh, okay. As the person down a rabbit hole the, for sure, the, though. Yeah, fair enough. As the person of the three of us who spent the most time down that rabbit hole, uh, I would. I was just wondering if you do that or not. They like because I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why they weren't translated to English at the same time. I think Rudolf Rocker, an anarchist, translated the first volume to english and then just no one has bothered to do the second volume okay um so just to just as a as a heads up obviously you know 
you guys can can keep talking for as as long as as you two want after i go but i do i am going to turn into a pumpkin in about 12 15 minutes so uh if if that can we talk about bakunin before you go and then if that impacted how you wanted to structure the next little bit of the discussion just wanted to yeah yeah let's 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 leave prudon aside for now and talk about bakunin because i have something to say about him based on like basically one step up from reading wikipedia um okay and wow. robertson describes the difference uh that marx had with bakunin in a in a piece in a socialist journal and she said bakunin believed that mankind was a moral creature by nature whereas marx believed that mankind's nature was essentially free and rational robertson describes this as a conflict between uh enlightenment and empirical or empiricist um understandings of the world on bakunin's side and a hegelian approach on the other so um, I, I thought that might be a useful thing to say about Bakunin and anarchism. Um, so, uh, sorry, so, sorry the, what was the Hegelian approach? And then what was the first one? Marx, the first one was like the empiricist and enlightenment view okay. of, of the human person. So like we are basically it's similar to Proudhon in a way. It's like we're rational creatures always working on solving the kind of the same problems. Okay. We have this internal... It, it, we are reasoned creatures. We are Prometheus. We are the, you know, we've discovered uh, mankind's true nature. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll say that. And then I have another follow up to that okay. for you specifically, Ben. But go ahead, Ben. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to steer way clear of of trying to comment on on Bakunin because uh, um, I haven't, you know, I mean, I've read a teeny bit of Bakunin over the years, but I mean, like, you know, I, I haven't even looked at his Wikipedia as recently as you have. So um, I'm going to, but I will say that the point about Hegel um, is interesting because I guess I don't. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of a, like, because the obvious follow-up question is like, okay, like what's the Hegelian view, right? <laughs> that, uh, well, I don't know what she thinks the Hegelian view is. Um yeah. But the, but I would say the Hegelian view would be something along the lines of what we described earlier, only not in terms of modes of production, but what maybe in terms of modes of life or uh -huh. of ideologies or something like that. The development of different conditions and the development of a condition of freedom through a process of historical unfolding, which does create change. Yeah. Um, rather that yeah, that might be right. So I, I know, um, I mean, the Hegel stuff is also certainly part of what Marx understands as being an issue between him and Proudhon that, uh, that, um, you know, Proudhon says all this stuff in, um, in, in the philosophy of poverty that is, you know, he he doesn't say the word Hegel, so it's open to interpretation. But you know, but it's it feels very Hegelian. He's using he's certainly using a lot of the same words in the same ways that people who uh, that people who are trying to describe Hegel's dialectics use them. Um, that much, at least, we could say for sure. You know, thesis and antithesis, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and you know. I, I know from our discussion before, um, you know, I, I know from our discussion before we recorded this, that there's a, there's an alternate view according to which that, you know, he's really trying to do something else, but, uh, they, but, um, but it, it certainly, you know, that was certainly my, my reading, you know, without Mark's you know, without filtering it through Marx's reading, I mean, that was that was what I thought when I was reading it. It's like, oh, it seems like he's trying. You know, it seems like he's using all this Hegelian language here, um, and Marx certainly takes it that way. But you know, but he accuses him of like misunderstanding Hegel. You know, he defends the honor of Hegel just like he defends the honor of the bourgeois economists, uh, and uh, and and he says, no, 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 this isn't what you know, this isn't what Hegel is saying because really it's this it's this other thing like you know kind of like kind of what you kind of what you just said right that um you know he has i mean i think the alternate reading is that Proudhon is 
really doing something that's supposed to be like Kant's uh, antinomies of, of pure reason. Although I don't know that I totally understand how that view works because the whole, the whole point about the antinomies of pure reason is that they're unsolvable. Um, and, and it, it does seem like um, it does seem like uh, Proudhon thinks that there are, you know, there are solutions uh, to, to, to all of this. I mean, that, which that, would make him a Hegelian, right? <laughs> well, I suppose so, right? Yeah, 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 right. Cause that's a way of reading like the, the progression from Kant to Hegel that, you know, that, right. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, I think that might be right, you know, but, um, but this is, you know, so there's, there are two questions here. One is an exegetical question, right? Which is, um, is Proudhon trying to be Hegelian and failing? Um, and then there's the, then there's like the, the sort of substantive philosophical question, which is, well, if he's not trying to be Hegelian, should he, right? Like, uh, right. you know, is, right. is, is, is the, is the thing that's like, is the thing that, you know, Proudhon's getting wrong sort of the, you know, sort of down to the, uh, his point having a, you know, insufficiently Hegelian structure to it, which, uh, is, is certainly what, what Marx thinks. and um you know, in a, in a weird way, right. Despite, um, you know, like, despite not, you know, not really being the kind of, you know, Marx guy who typically talks in a very Hegelian way. I, I kind of think he's right about that, you know, for, for the reasons that we've been talking about. Yeah. I, before you go, Ben, I want to ask you both a question or put this in a, into a different, the whole thing into a different context, make it a little bit less academic, maybe. Sure. Um, to put it into this com- current contemporary political context, maybe around uh, foreign uh, policy and war. And I've noticed over the last couple of years, it seems to me that a lot of the arguments in politics, whether they're on the left or the right, are assuming that the difficulties uh, and the wars and the conflicts are arising uh, due to uh, people who are just failing to be proper, moral, mm. just characters, mm. um, and that uh, the it come has come down to deciding: Are you on Putin's side, or are you on Ukraine's side? Are you on Hamas's side, or are you on Israel's side? Oh, yeah. um, rather than looking at the problems that are on both sides, the problem that is universal that we might want to change. In other words, changing a mode, the mode of production as a Marxist would change the kinds of problems we're facing. Mm-hmm. Changing the politics um, in the Middle East would change the kinds of problems that we're facing. Breaking from a Wilsonian nationalist model of world politics into an internationalist model would change the kinds of problems that we're facing. And it would not be a matter of like, choosing one side or another. And so this is, this has been my, what I've attempted to say, I have not been taking, you know, some people like what I say, some people do not. But um, do you think that uh, there are times where conceptions of what's just end up reinforcing um, this mode of production or this way of life as the only possible, as a universal transhistorical way of life that doesn't have the possibility for change, especially when we're judging a situation like, you know, the war in Ukraine. Oh, I, I definitely can say to that, but I know you're on time limit, so. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Go, go, go first, Ben. Okay, okay. sure. Sh- sure. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree with a part of that, right? So I, I guess the... You know, I think that saying that like appeals to to moral sentiment have no place in all this would be going too far. I think that um Marx um very frequently appeals to moral sentiment in 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 his writings, right? That um I mean, you know, certainly anybody who's read the last section of Capital knows that. Uh but um 
like you know oftentimes they're like kind of raw waves of moral disgust you know rolling off the page and you know that's that's uh, that's definitely part of the intended effect but i i the sense in which i agree with you is that i do think that um I do think that there is a way that uh, and I'm trying to think of how to put this without sounding too one note or too much like, you know, the old man yelling at this, you know, sky, the cloud, right? The em uh, em Embrace it. Embrace it. I am the old man yelling at the sky. I accept it. Go ahead. Uh, but I do think that, like, I do kind of blame Twitter for some of this. Like, I think that people... I think a lot of people are trained by like a lot of people whose primary engagement with politics is online and whose primary engagement, you know, and sort of has to do with these like news cycles and these, these cycles of who's mad about who, about what, uh, who's mad at who about what, mm -hmm. um, tend to the only way they can really process anything that goes on politically is by, is by just kind of having an immediate emotional reaction to it. And then like, sort of doing the thing that maximally matches, you know, that reaction, not actually doing anything, but, you know, having the rhetorical position that, you know, mo most, most clearly matches that. So, um, so if you're, um, so, uh, so if you have like the, the, you know, the, whoever you're the most mad at, right. You know, you should just sort of take the position that most clearly, you know, captures your your condemnation and vituperation of that you know person or government or block or whatever right so um you know if if you have you know if you're like sort of properly disgusted by you know putin's invasion of ukraine which you know i actually think you should be but you know but if but you know if you are then you should support the sort of maximalist like you know, the U S should be super involved in this position because that, that kind of, that kind of captures that, uh, that, you know, most appropriately in, in your, your mind, right. You know, you kind of can't have a perspective other than sort of what do I condemn the most strongly? And then how do I express that condemnation? Um, or, uh, or even, I don't want to exaggerate this point because I think it's prevalence is really overstated. Um, I actually get the sense that I don't, I don't know how either. You know, well, let's but, do it the opposite. But, 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 Douglas, but I, Douglas Murray, Douglas Murray, who was condemning the attacks of October 7th, yeah. writing for the New York Post, um, walking through the kibbutzes where people were murdered, mm -hmm. um, it, uh, outlining uh, the horror of it. And it was all horrible, right? It was. Sure. And then like his what what his ultimate aim is, is to say, therefore, no matter what Israel does, we cannot criticize Israel. We, yeah, we cannot, yeah, we cannot, is, con we the, cannot condemn. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. Like, you know, that the, that you have either, you know, you either do the Douglas Murray thing, which I've seen lots of that, um, you know, I mean, certainly on social media, you see this all the time. People saying like, uh, here's the, uh, you know, here's this horrible thing. Uh, then therefore, right. You know, no ceasefire. Therefore, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. you know, everything Israel's doing is, is okay. And then there's the opposite phenomenon, which again, I think it's prevalence is really overstated, but it definitely exists. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is, um, which is sort of like, well, what I'm most mad about is the, uh, the, the, the dispossession and oppression and by, you know, state violence against the, the Palestinians. And the thing that sort of most fully captures this is like, I'm not just going to be against what Israel's doing. I'm going to like support hamas you know that they uh right, right. Like, like like something like that right i mean i think that you you end up in strange and stupid places if you're if you're just processing everything through like what am i most outraged about and, and what position sort of you know feels like it captures uh captures that outrage the best right you know this is the you know the thing that i'm you know like i i've been saying a lot for the last couple of years that I, I, you know, I really, uh, you know, and, and certainly even in like domestic politics, you know, there are a lot of people who will say, um, that, uh, they have, um, that, you know, I, I think, I think that there are a lot of people who, who again, come to a lot of strange and stupid places because 
what they do, I mean, it's not even really just like tailing some element of existing politics. That's what people think it is. But I don't, I actually think that's slightly wrong. What it is, is like reverse tailing whoever you dislike the most, right? So uh, if the, if the people who, who piss you off the most are, uh, are conservatives, you just, you just say whatever the opposite is of, you know, of what you think they're, you know, they're saying or whatever you think is going to sort of most fully express your opposition to them, which, you know, usually means just siding with, you know, whatever, you know, whatever the liberals are saying today. Uh, and if, uh, if the people who piss you off the most are like annoying PMC libs, you know, then you, uh, then you, you end up, uh, saying, you know, you end up taking all these positions to, to sort of spite them. And then, you know, you, you somehow convinced yourself to become some kind of strange, you know, communist quasi right winger. And oh, just, or just gone completely right. I mean, that happens a lot too. Or yeah, or you just go frankly right. Totally right. That happens yeah, all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally right. So I, I, I think that is, you know, and, and I think that yeah, I think that's all pretty bad. I mean, like it's uh, and, and in a weird way, like it almost feels more like a, um, I don't know, just kind of uh, and and I realize when I tell people to log off, I'm like the guy with the uh the rolled up uh 20 still in his nose with blood dripping from it saying you know <laughs> you know we should all be doing less coke right now right you know like right. i i'm clearly too online but they have a, but like mm -hmm. uh but that said i think we should all start doing less coke right like i think that uh i think that's objectively true however hypocritical that right, I, right. you know that it's that that i think that uh i think logging off and uh you know spending spending more time reading books and less time being angry and uh you know like uh you know so you can kind of work forwards right from like okay here are uh you know here's the analysis of the material world around me that i find convincing and sure here also are the the socialist you know normative values that i care about um and let's work forward from that instead of just kind of like letting the waves of outrage wash over me and kind of take me where they may yeah well i i think well, you're gotta go right ben you're gonna yeah yeah, yeah. no I, I i should i've gotta go uh i've gotta go drive to burbank and teach and i need to pick up like a print order for like the review sheet for the final exam first so um so yeah i, I should i should actually be going you, are you guys gonna carry on in my absence a little bit yeah i think at least on this topic cyber dandy should have a go yeah of uh, course yeah all right sounds good talk to you guys both soon all right thanks ben Okay. So what did you think of that? Uh Expectations from him and my question both. Well, his answer went in a totally different direction than anything I was thinking about. So there is kind of a materialist way to look at what Ben is saying with Twitter and uh, you know, this is the means of communication, right? There is a there is a uh a mode, a social mode that corresponds with that kind of means right and there is a reason why our means of communication have developed into being this way right mm -hmm. which is a function of advertising public relations and uh the different ways that we become you know self-improving products for uh, our employers and whatnot but yeah, that very far from what I was thinking. Um, yeah. So, what were you thinking? So, oddly enough, Proudhon is someone who wrote uh, a pretty extensive work that was just recently translated into English called War and Peace. And hmm. that is, in fact, where, what is it, Thoreau got the title from for their War and Peace. Um, and he is actually... I haven't finished reading it. Was it was Tolstoy. Tolstoy. Tolstoy, right. Yeah. I one, thought one so, but the... I was like, I'm not so quick anymore. So I had to double check that it was actually Tolstoy. But yeah, Tolstoy, not Thoreau. Anyway, go on. That, uh, so he, so... Tolstoy stole, plagiarized Proudhon. I'm not, what... I'm, I actually I'm not think kidding. it's uh, something Tolstoy even said, like yeah, okay. credit Proudhon. Mm -hmm. Um. And when the book came out, apparently it was pretty controversial because they thought Proudhon was becoming a big war advocate and uh, hmm. justifying war as, you know, this sort of inevitable good thing that 
helps society get better. Um, Mm. But ultimately, that's not really what he was doing with it. And it's interesting that on the one hand, when we talk about him as this person of justice, he's also this guy that's saying, well, no, war is uh, kind of a function of his weird idea of justice um in that it uh uh it it's force in a way that's like imminently uh applied justice or something like that but uh, throughout the book basically he comes to you know he's really worried about the industrialization of war that's happening you know in his lifetime Mm -hmm. and he's worried about the way that the nation state is concentrating militaries into or yeah concentrating militaries into these really strong centralized forces that are capable of massive destruction he basically he does look at federalization and decentralization and uh trade as being some of these things that that can prevent the most disastrous kind of wars even though you can't totally get rid of war I think the Marxist view would be that uh, concentration and mass cooperation are liberating as well as oppressive, and that the idea would be to overcome the contradiction in the form of, uh, uh, at the base of society, in the the production, in the realm of production, in order to take the power of the mass of humanity that organized sometimes in centralized ways, sometimes not. Uh, and turn it into a force of liberation. Um, also, as far as like free trade goes, certainly like as a Marxist, with my understanding of of what socialism is, I'm not opposed to free trade. Um, right. I just I am opposed to uh, the final horizon of human development being determined by commodity production. So. Braid, well, I mean, that's a big general abstract thing that's always been around trade. People have given things to each other. But um, free trade in today's context, um, it's just never, it's just always going to kind of collapse, uh, run up against its own internal contradictions. And uh, it's going to be, you know, a, a, a realm of competition between nations rather than cooperative the production and exchange um so uh, as a marxist i would want to see the free development of production um and you know an alternative mode of exchange develop out of that um but uh yeah the the but that's like maximal that's like down the road like the the question for me right now is how can we um avoid uh the the politics of our spleens in this moment and being led uh by like i'll just give a real concrete example we can maybe discuss this a little bit like um i see uh like an art like the editorial from cosmonaut sort of defined for me what the current radical marxist position was on uh, the conflict between Palestine and Israel, and it was an embrace of Hamas. Um, it, and it was saying Hamas, like it or not, Hamas is the uh, really existing force for Palestinian liberation. They're the leading edge of Palestinian of the Palestinian resistance. Therefore, without uh, any uh, reservations we should support the Palestinian resistance and therefore we support Hamas. Um, and don't be a, a, a coward, you know, in this moment where the Palestinians need us and things like that. That was the editorial statement. It was presented not as a way, uh, as an argument based on an analysis of conditions, but more based on the uh, injustice that was so evident in Gaza before and after 
right? So because this is unjust, therefore any means that has a material force behind it to to cause uh, Palestinian liberation should be supported. And I, I don't, uh, first, I don't think you can disconnect means from ends that way. Um, and also, I don't think Hamas's aims are to create a liber liberated Palestinian civil society or to liberate individual Palestinians or to create conditions of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and while I understand that living under a theocracy uh, of your own making might be preferable to living as an oppressed second class or third or fourth or fifth class citizen in someone else's theocracy. Um, it still isn't th that, you know, I'm not willing to make that kind of calculation as a socialist. It's like we can right. do a lot better. There are, there are forces within Israel and within Palestine, which have a much deeper, better political understanding and which are not reactionary. Um, right. That so. It's yeah, it's um, you know, like why why isn't the mainstream of socialist discourse right now calling for a revolution in Israel, right? Or yeah, or at the very least supporting some even social democratic party in Israel to overturn, you know, it's like a, a Israeli left party that wants to have a better some one or two state solution for the Palestinian right. conflict and depose netanyahu well why like, is the left talking about deposing netanyahu how do like, how do we how do so many people get hooked into the frame being defined for them and don't ever get outside of that frame and do a material analysis or do look at the means of production and what led to you know look at the property relations that led to uh the creation of the state of israel you know how did all that happen you don't see this. I just did a whole episode on it with uh, Gene Bajlan. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't, I definitely am not the type of person that just accepts the framework of you have these two sides and you got to pick one. Uh, you know, I'm not even sure I accept the framework that this is the most important thing we have to all be talking about right now. Um, right. My my large critique of the left right now is that it doesn't center itself and it does sort of hop from uh, whatever the most outrageous conflict happening at the moment is. When, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion, there should be an, an internal way for the left to discover its own priorities and discover its own objectives and look at the world through that lens and how do you achieve those you know mm -hmm. given you know maybe palestine is not the place where anything is going to get done by the left maybe it's you know rojava maybe it's you know chiapas or maybe you know, it's the united states of america right maybe, where we have the most freedoms of any in most civil liberties anyway of any nation on earth we have a lot of problems a lot of backwards thinking but you know uh i think the opportunity for organizing is best here better than in france or in canada even you know um at the, but only slightly better uh but there, there are some benefits to being in the united states for sure yeah and and one of them is that they can't outright outlaw political protest, which they have in France and Germany and Canada. Um, Although, they can't yeah. Back in the IWW days, I mean, they definitely were shutting down all the peace activists. Or, I guess oh, no, I know. No, 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 I know. And, and look, it's not like I think that they're going to go, oh, yes, go right ahead. Even though you're threatening us, you know, they're going to do everything they can to undermine the liberty that we already have achieved and yeah. try to go back on it but um nonetheless at least we're starting from a place of generalized assumed liberty around political expression and organizing um that you know we have that 
there are institutions that are in place to protect those rights, like the ACLU um, and and hell, the Congress, uh, you know, and the Supreme Court. These things exist and they actually matter. And I think, uh, you know, as just as, you know, even though the Congress and the Supreme Court uh, can be and even the ACLU can be turned into weapons against the working class at the moment, they're they're It's uncertain. And we should we should press on political organizing here. But it's very difficult times. And we're going to be anything we do right now will be seen as uh, either assisting. I mean, although I don't know, but it will be a scene as assisting uh, the fascists, assisting Trump and his minions and so forth. Yeah, I think one way, you know, maybe if not advocating for actually taking office or getting elected to any of these positions, I think it's still, uh, at least, you know, as far as like our discourse goes, it's important to pay attention to what legislation is being passed, whether it's, you know, just boilerplate written by a think tank, you know, if it's being to, to, to be aware of all the boring stuff so that we don't get so caught up in the exciting stuff. Right. Well, it, it, and I'm pretty bored with the exciting stuff. It's not really, <laughs> it, you know, that I guess what I will say is that like reading the New York times coverage of the horrible tragedy unfolding in Gaza is emotionally moving and it it's difficult not to to be made upset by that you should be made upset by that if you're reading about the the babies and the children laid out under shrouds in the streets of Gaza or still buried under rubble you know it's horrible and then you know the murder of women and children on October 7th um yeah you know, not as bad if you in a quantitative way but horrible and i could read the new york post if i wanted to be moved about that sure. um but uh it, uh, ov ov overall like you know every once in a while i like to be um in a position to be able to think rather yeah. than simply feel um well, and even if you just were to follow Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or something, you're still getting uh, more than one tragedy at a time or like, right, right. you know, which I think is an important way to balance out um, the hyper focus that that mainstream media tends to generate and uh, impassion people about, you know. Like one example, have you do you know about all the Afghans that were just exiled from? Uh, yeah, I've heard about that. Pakistan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a huge crisis. Uh, it's not getting a lot of air. Yeah, the Syrian well, civil war. They, they don't belong there, and they're not native there, so it's not the same. Well, right, right, exactly. We could question some of the yeah. ideology behind why one place gets attention and not another. Obviously, U.S. funding is a big part of why so many people pay attention to Israel. But right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there there's, you know, you're familiar with labor notes. I am familiar with it, but I haven't read it lately. It's, you know, fairly boring, but it's one of the few places that tracks ongoing labor struggles. Right. And maybe that kind of an approach to world crises would be a way to at least have a map of things that are concurrently happening so that it's easier to decide what our framework should be and what our priorities should be. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. Um, well, and I'll right now, what I have been focused on the most for most of this year has been the systematic attempt to undermine those liberties that I was saying you U S citizens had that made this a place where we should focus on organizing, which is, you know, the right to assemble and the right to speak and uh, publish. Um, and, uh, I feel as though, um, it, I've yet to figure out where to, the fight should be 
uh, where, what, what, where we should prioritize uh, as we struggle to maintain and expand civil liberties. Um, I still think probably the United States, but it's very, you get this world system where uh, uh, international company might have a victory in the United States in court and over, you know, protect its uh, free speech rights in the United States. But because it's also operating in England, you know, has to abide by English law and may be defeated there. And so now the, the effect is in the United States, U.S. citizens and British subjects are are both censored by by the same multinational well, yeah. company on the like, on the dictates would... of the same basic NATO D.C. blob consensus. Right. You know? Or like what like, like TikTok. Right. Like. Uh, there's some companies you can't have it on your company phone anymore. I don't think it has anything to do with U.S. law. I think it has to do with like their international companies where that's not allowed wherever they are mm -hmm. operating uh, elsewhere. There's a lot of stuff like that. Um, you could mm -hmm. look at that as a free, a freedom issue, a free speech. Well, I, to I totally do. And I uh, completely oppose the Restrict Act or any variations on it, which was put together under the just with the justification that you know tiktok is a chinese threat to american right. security but it actually would have empowered the federal government in the in the white house to simply ban any company that they thought or called a threat to national security maybe mine my little company you know like it it it, it was not aimed only at tiktok at all it was empower, em, empowering and uh extending the reach of the white house and the federal government to control speech um and on in the name of national security and i completely oppose that which me, and i definitely think that we should allow tiktok and russia today and any other uh press or media to be seen in the united states we're supposed to be able to think and determine for ourselves what we believe so supposedly yeah <laughs> yeah Maybe not. Maybe I need to just get on board with the nanny state, except that people are sheep. And no, I don't think so. I'm not going to do that. Um, well, well, listen, go ahead. You, you have the final one word. last thing. I know you wanted okay. to complain about anarchists a little bit, so mm. we could do some yeah, complaining. I wanted to say that, the re I, you know, look, I don't look. I definitely think Proudhon and Bakunin are well worth reading, and I don't want to, like, just toss people who are anarchists and are thinking about uh, revolution in those terms into the, the, the waistband. My problem with anarchists is maybe cultural more than anything, because what I find with anarchists is that there's a, that when in the, at the end of the day, they aren't anarchists in the old sense. They're like the uh, leading edge of the democratic party. Like they're like, we're going to go out there and, fight in the street with Trump supporters and that's their anarchism rather than, you know, some thoughtful critique of the state. Like the last thing that yeah. the anarchists will oppose is the, the progressive capitalist state um, today, it seems to me, but maybe I'm being unfair. I haven't spent a lot of time in uh, anarchist milieus lately. So am well, I wrong? It, I, you know, I, I'd have to say I have a hard time getting a big picture on what anarchism looks like in the United States right now, because uh, a lot of the, you know, like. So I rejoined Twitter and um, all I see is stuff from anarchists and socialists. However, the algorithm worked itself out. That's all I see. And if I were to go by that, I would think that there were no there literally were no anarchists in the united states um <laughs> right on the other hand i've been a long time uh um technician sometimes a moderator for the largest what could be argued as the largest north american anarchist project which mm -hmm. is anarchistnews.org mm -hmm. and so there's i'm if that can be considered a milieu uh, I don't think it's the milieu because a lot of people hate it. Uh, it's considered, it's the only anarchist source where you're allowed to comment on anything anonymously. 
And mm-hmm. so a lot of people respond to it as being like a troll haven. Um, and a lot of the people associated it would have been more nihilistic or individualistic anarchists. Uh, so mm-hmm. there, you know, there is a, there's a sectarianism that has grown around that resource for years. Um, and then what, besides that, you have like stuff that often won't even explicitly be anarchist, like it's going down or, uh, um, you know, so a whole host of podcasts that are tied into something called, uh, channel zero networks or something, or maybe I'm confusing that with something else, but yeah, uh, as far as the anarchists that get the attention it's going to be the ones on Twitter and the ones on Reddit and uh, the worst um, behaving ones in, in street events. Yeah. I was going to say, it seems to me like anarchism is defined by Antifa now. And Antifa uh, is to me, um, uh, shock troops for the progressive capitalist state at the moment. Um, So, but that's maybe, Maybe that's right wing of me to say, but uh, that's how it looks to me. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I, I kind of lumped that into what I was saying about these projects that won't be explicitly anarchist. They'll, uh, you know, present a core anarchist ideology in some way, but they'll be rather open to just about anyone who won't be against that core. Antifa being an example, right? A lot of non-anarchists are part of antifa but um you know it runs into the obvious problems that if you're not really going to have any kind of explicit uh ideology and kind of police the boundaries of that you're going to wind up with all sorts of uh whether it's just people being dumb and making mistakes or informants or um you know whatever kind of psychological operations that whoever feels like doing at the time it's like Mm -hmm. there's been a lot of instances of police being you know unmasked uh oh yeah yeah that's yeah like if you uh there's a joke about this from the 60s about like this maoist group and you know when they were dragged to court uh maybe it's not even a joke it's like half of their membership were fbi something like that you know like they they it's like it was insane yeah but, uh, i think the jury's definitely still out on how to um how to prevent that from happening whether or not like clandestinity is better or being totally public is better there's a lot of arguments on both sides but i think being totally public is better I think when you're clandestine, you're going to be uh, even you're more ripe for the worst ideas and the more to, to be set up for for uh, illegal activity that will be, you know, used against you. You're, you're, you're more more stings and things like that. Whereas if it's a public group, then you're already restrained from. From making those kinds of stupid decisions. Yeah. And then there's another problem. Like there's no one to say this was an official Antifa action, right? It's, it could literally be any group wearing the right clothes and writing the right communique. Uh, Right. Yeah. Posting on the right Reddit, that kind of thing. Well, listen, we'll, we should come back and do Bakunin. Um, I enjoyed this very much and uh, uh, you know, I mean, I was an anarchist for a long time, and I, I do not dislike anarchists. I just uh, try to defend Marx. Uh, There's a path back. There's a path back, <laughs> Doug. Come over read to Dan- the Marx side. Read Daniel oh. Gurin. Uh, you know what? Either one. If either anarchism or Marxism could revive itself, I'd join. It, uh, you know, <laughs> at this point, neither one is alive. So, um, all right. I'm going to stop recording there. All right.